eae monsio kalepite have mamoi io kafo po hufeta cho ek mamoi io eae monsio kalepite have mamoi io kafo po hufeta cho ek mamoi io e a e mon si o kalpite have ma moi i o ka fo po hu fe ta cho ek ma moi i o the mcst and the iwsa have a strong relationship going back to the first sustainable sea transport talano in suva back in 2012 when we first met with uh, Mr. Gavin Allright. Mr. Allright has been a champion of MCSD ever since um, well, we first established relations and we've been proud to be early members of the IWSA along with other key partners being the University College of London and Hoskul and the Nier. He is the Secretary General for the IWSA being a member driven not-for-profit organization with over 150 active stakeholders from across the shipping industry, all dedicated to developing and facilitating the uptake of wind propulsion in commercial shipping. An integral part of that position is representing the organization at policy level at both in the International Maritime Organization, the IMO in London, and the European Sustainable Shipping Forum, ESSF. Mr. Allright also sits as a non-executive board member of the World Wind Energy Association. He holds a master's degree in sustainable development and has contributed to many reports, academic papers, et cetera, focused on the decarbonization of shipping and is also a visiting lecturer at the World Maritime University. And in his spare time, he coaches a number of youth rugby teams. The MCSD has watched the IWSA grow and flourish to become the go-to one shop for everything surrounding wind powered shipping with a growing global membership and increasing portfolio of case studies across the global shipping fleet. The IWSA gaining observer status at the International American Organization uh, also marked another milestone and for the six pack plus and the IWSA have been working very close together at the IMO in the negotiations over greenhouse gas uh, reductions. We know that wind is part of the global solution and it will certainly play a major role in the Pacific's domestic transition. We need to ensure that wind is fully factored into the policy at the IMO. To celebrate this relationship, we have invited a number of panelists of local and global expertise to lead our Talano on wind powered shipping on the past, the present and the future. Therefore, we now begin our first round of panel presentations on the past. Our first speaker is Captain Setareki Lendua. He has realized his dream to Captain Andrua being a traditional sailing vessel in Fiji and hopes that in 10 years, he will see 100 Drua sailing throughout the islands in Fiji. Having grown up on the islands, he has been a passionate advocate for the ocean um, in all its diverse creatures, the plants, the winds, the rains, the stars, and the seasons. He also graduated in 2010 from the Fiji Institute of Technology and began both modern and traditional uh, methods of maritime navigation. He is an NZCG day skipper and boatmaster. In 2016, he graduated from the maritime school with a master's in engineering and became captain of the sailing vessel Moana. In 2018, he became captain of the sailing catamaran Utunialo, and from 2018 till present, he has been the captain of Thandrua Evola Singapore. Having sailed around the Pacific region and the world a few times, he is currently one of the only two trained navigators in Fiji, and is currently teaching at the University of Fiji um, with the Center for Itauke Affairs. Our second speaker for the past is Dr. Alexander Moore. He is the current director of the Center for Pacific Island Studies and the acting chair of the Department of Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. His research interests include language and space in oceanic linguistics, 
biocultural indicators, conservation and indigenous sovereignty, and marine resource governance. He served as the editor for the contemporary, um, for the journal, the Contemporary Pacific, a journal of 2016 to 2021. He sits on the board of the University of Hawaii Press, UHP, and is a member of the scientific uh, committee of the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme du Pacifique and the Raoui Center, among other board memberships. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the past. And I ask uh, some uh, um, housekeeping rules for everyone uh, while our uh, uh, respective uh, panelists are sharing. We ask that if you could please uh, mute your microphone and if you have any questions you can either you can post it on our group chat or after all of our panelists have spoken then we will conduct our talano and you can either raise your hand or you can post in the in our group meeting chat and then we will uh, we will carry out our talano but having that said ladies and gentlemen the past vinaka captain I guess it's my turn. Um, now, I with John. Thank you very much uh, for for the for the introduction, uh, and thank you, Maria, for the invitations. Uh, Maria called me um, uh, few, uh, last week, the week before last. Um, she called me if I wanted to uh, to um, to be uh, one of the panelists for this webinar. I was just preparing uh, to heading off to London uh, the day uh, before she called me. Anyway, um, this morning I just got back from London. I transit through uh, through uh, San Francisco, and I just got in after six a.m. this morning, and uh, I arranged the school transport to pick me up from the airport and drop me off this morning, so just so that I can be here for this webinar. Uh, and there, it has been a a busy um, one week in London, uh, trying to uh, you know, uh, climatize myself to, to the local weather in London. I, uh, I didn't have any time to prepare uh, a PowerPoint presentation. However, I got here this morning, I, I managed to pull together um, a couple of slides. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my screen. my screen. I think you're able to share screen. I'm not sure how this thing works. There we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Tata, you're on Tata, mute. you're on mute. Uh, can you hear me now? Perfect. Uh, so yeah, Pacific Wind Power Shipping. Um, so Maria sent me an email if I can just tell stories and on on the past. Um, so our past. Um, so yeah, you know the some of us may know the the Lao group where I came from used to be the traditional um, canoe building hub for the Pacific in the old days. Uh, you know, the, the people in, in the old days moved cargo uh, around the Pacific using big tours and they sail across the vast oceans using wind without any drop of fossil fuel. 
Um, so yeah, you know the 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 the, um, the board builders in the Mate South from Tonga and Samoa used to settle in 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 uh, in the Lao group, uh, and they build big tours where they sell it uh, they sell it across uh, uh, to the Pacific and they move cargo um, around the oceans by using the wind. And um, and today, till today, you know, we 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 still debating. Uh, whether whether the, the the design of the tour belongs to Fiji or to Tonga, where they call it Takalia, or whether it was come the design was come from comes from Samoa, where they call it the Alia, you know the same design, uh, same meaning. Um, you know, uh, last year, uh, no, early early this year, I happened to be in uh, in Germany, uh, where they got this um, museum. Uh, the exhibition in, in a museum and they have a storage in one of the universities in, in Germany uh, where, where they have all these artifacts from all around the Pacifics, which are more than hundred of years it's been collected in this storage. And I, you know, I happen to see uh, the, the model of a, uh, a Kalia, a model of an Alia and a model of a Drua sitting side by sides in this storage. Uh, and uh, they they've been they've been stored in in that storage for all. Um, uh, when I asked them, they said it's been there for over 200 years and still in tech, except the sale, uh, which is um, you know they soak it in in the in a chemicals where they where they can last for for a long time. But the sales, it's kind of it's kind of. Um, uh, 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 oh, oh, and, and you know when we touch the sales, it's kind of breaking. And it's uh, uh, you know I happen to to see the evidence of the 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 people uh, the, that works in that storage. You know they were confusing uh, where. You know, they, there's a tag in there that when they they wrote the tag Tonga, but they put a question mark in there. So I walked in into the storage and I saw the, the Gagalia and, and uh, they saw the sign was there. It says Tonga and it was a question mark. And I said, no, this is not um, uh, a Tongan design. This is actually a someone design. And, um, and they said, oh, how, how do you know? I said, I'll look at the... The domon domo, which is the mass head, which uh, you know, I, I was able to pick it up uh, straight away that it was from from Samoa, uh, the Alia, and uh, next to next to the Alia was 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 the drua, uh, and the rig of the drua was you know was uh, was not up but it was down, and I said this is uh, but they said Samoa, a question mark on the tag and they put it on the drua, and I said no this is this one is from Fiji, but next to um, next to the drua was a was a design from Micronesia, and the next to other the, uh, the canoe, the, the model from Micronesia was the the Kalia from Tonga, and I said, no, this is the Tongan design. Um, yeah, no, I, I happened to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, to walk into um, into that storage, and within two hours, you know, I was able to be, uh, I was able to see all the artifacts of uh, of. Uh, from all around the Pacific that's been there for 200 years. And I told them, you know, I happen to, uh, to be, to, to walk around the Pacific uh, in the last 200 years within, within two hours and able to, you know, to, um, to witness the, the similarities in the artifacts that they have all around the Pacific um, and, and uh, uh, that's, that's been stored it's over some of them it's been over 100 years it's been stored in that storage in in germany but anyway you know still to, even today we're still debating whether where, where the seal uh, the sail rigs comes from because our cousins from micronesia and are even from uh from the muscles up in the muscles muscle islands they use the same uh, the same sail rigs and the same sail design uh and they too have the sanding system um sailing system which we uh, we have in, in Fiji uh, on the tour when we have to change direction. We we don't actually turn uh, tack through the wind, attack into the wind, uh, or jump into the wind. Where we sand the sail, we just move the sail 
from one end to the other end where the back becomes the front and the front becomes the back. Uh, so this is, you know, this is um, a few evidence that uh, that we can say that our forefathers have this amazing relationship that they, they, they have back in the olden days. At, at the same time, they sail and move cargo around the oceans to exchange knowledge um, in, in the Pacific. Um, so here, yeah, you know, uh, our ocean uh, protection knowledge, it's, it's only can be learned and updated while we're voyaging on, on, on the Asian routes um, and networks uh, where our forefathers uh, and I have sailed before us. Um, so yeah, it, it, you know, it's for me, um, as John is uh, mentioning the introduction, um, I'm currently one of the only two trained navigators in Fiji, and at the moment, um, you know, I've sailed around the Pacific and I've sailed around um, uh, uh, to some parts of the world. Uh, 2010, 2011, 2010, I was of, I was one of the uh, I was one of the train navigator on the Utunialo, where we sailed to New Zealand, French Polynesia, um, up to uh, uh, Hawaii and to the States and down the coast to Mexico and all the way down to Cocos, um, Cocos Island, which is one of the old marine reserves in the world, uh, to the Galapagos and back into the Pacific. Um, and the whole voyage took us two years. And um, yeah, and then I've sailed around the Pacific a few times uh, on the Utunialo. And in 2020, uh, we we I, uh, we took the Drua um, to the Lao Group. Uh, the Drua was uh, was built and funded by Dr. Peter Nato, uh, who is uh, present here with us today, and um, and the partner uh, Allison. And uh, I have been, you know, I was fortunate to uh, to be um, to be the captain of, of the Drua um, that we take our, our, our sail. We call it a, we, we that because of as I've mentioned before, the Lao Group used to be the building center um, in in of the Pacific back in the olden days. So what we wanted to do, we call it a homecoming sail. Uh, we wanted to backtrack that route. Um, uh, they were because when when they build rules because of the south southeasterly trade winds, um, uh, the southeasterly trade winds of Kampara and Hulanga was mostly where the um, where the the, the Matai Sawu or the boat builders from Tonga and Samoa because of the southeasterly trade winds. So their so their routes their routes you know, back in the olden days they come through um, all this little island in the Lomai Viti. And uh, into Levuka, um, Levuka, which is here around here, uh, was one of the main the main transit points in um, in in the olden days before they sail across into other uh, you know to the other side of the Pacific. So um, because of the southerly trade winds, so, uh, and we wanted to back uh, backtrack that route uh, into the Lao Group. Um, as a homecoming sail, so we went through um, uh, through Leleuvia and to Koro in the Lomai Viti, and all the way to the Lao Group in, in the Northern Lao Group, and all the way down to um, to Lakemba Kambara and to Bulanga where I came from before we came back to Suvada. So the the homecoming voyage um, uh, was mainly because we wanted to. There was a record of. Um, of, of the drawers selling out of of uh, the the Lao group, but there is a stories of um, these stories of the drawers selling back, but there was no record uh, and hasn't been done in over 100 years. Uh, so uh, that's probably one of the reason uh, we wanted to uh, you know to backtrack and uh, and sell back uh, the, the the routes that they've been selling in, in the olden days, and also one of the reason was for us to honor our ancestors of um, who have uh, of, of who have uh, built the drua sailed the drua um, you know our uh, one of the reason why we we sailed back was to to honor uh, our ancestors and of course to ask their permissions as we as as for us as we're moving forward we need the permissions of our 
um, of our ancestors, of our forefathers, uh, to be able to move, you know, to track uh, our, our, our movements into the future. Um, so yes, you know, there's some of the voids that we, um, uh, we have done. And uh, you may ask why, why we voyage, uh, but one of the reasons why we voyage was to prove that there can be, um, that we can uh, sail around the world or sail around to any parts of the island around the Pacific without using technology, without using uh, GPS, without using, um, you know, uh, uh, a technology uh, where all the big boats are using, was to prove that we can sail to any parts of the, of the world uh, by just using nature, just by using um, the way our forefathers have sailed uh, in the olden days. Because um, um, when they sail, they only use elements, they use nature, anything that surrounds them every day, uh, you know, that gives them a clue uh, where they can set their course uh, to reach their destinations. And also one of the reasons why we sail was to promote to promote uh, sustainable sea transportation um, and, and also, so, you know, as a, as a solution from day to day transportation in, 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 in as maritime and um, they use uh, fiberglass boats with, with us and with outboard engines with the use of fossil fuel, you know, and with the cost of, uh, with the high cost of fossil fuel that comes in uh, today. Uh, um, you know, the sustainable uh, use uh, by using the drua or using our traditional canoe um, to sail around uh, around our other island, even around the lagoon, uh, is, is, is because it's sustainable. It's a, uh, it's a way that we can replace um, fiberglass boat with, uh, with also uh, with outboard without using uh, fossil fuel. And also, you know, the reason why we voyage was to reconnect with the people uh, of the oceans and, and strengthen our ties between the island uh, around the Pacific, and also to strengthen uh, the connection between between us and the oceans. Um, you know, our forefathers before 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 the the cars before the planes comes in, the ocean was their highway where they sail um, when the weather is right, where they sail uh, just to see each other, just you know, just to exchange knowledge. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's you know that's the voyage, and and that's what they they used to do uh, uh, back in the olden days. And um, yeah, so what lessons um, are from the past that we can learn uh, learn from moving forward uh, to a clean energy shipping? Um, you know, when I, when when I the first thing I learned about when the most important thing I learned when I train as a navigator. Uh, was still in the most valuable lessons that we can expand in, in our everyday life was, we, you know, before we set sail to uh, to go to to another place, the most important thing for us to know um, was for us to know where we come from um, and where you're heading to. You know, this was our most significant uh, valuable lessons in, in, for me uh, personally uh, to know where I come from. Uh, who you are and where you're heading to, uh, to know your identity and everything that surrounds you, everything about you, you have to know uh, before you know before you head it uh, to where you want to go. Uh, so yeah, you know, as, as for me, the lesson the lesson I wanted to put forward uh, um, today is that we 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 need um, we need our our traditional we need our traditional uh, knowledge. Um, with, with our you know with our indigenous knowledge as we now finding a solution uh, to move forward um, if we if we need a clean energy in shipping um, you know um, we I just when I when I was in London last week uh, we have uh, so we, we there's a collective of like 17 universities from all around the world that comes together to find a solution um, uh, on how can we we implement uh, traditional knowledge in in the universities and teach and how can we use that uh, traditional uh, um, knowledge to meet to mitigate climate change uh, you know uh, in in our workshop in in London we mostly 
talk about the community. Uh, we, we mostly talk about the knowledge uh, of our uh, indigenous people here uh, in, in every community. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, that, that, uh, that make me think that even now, when we try to find a solution uh, to, uh, to, uh, to campaign against climate change, or even now when we try to find a solution to clean energy, uh, it gives me um, uh, you know, um, a hope that we are looking back to, to the past to the knowledge that our ancestors or our father was already stored for us, uh, you know, you know that that one, uh, what I wanted to put forward is for us to go back to uh, to to go back to uh, to uh, to our traditional knowledge and how can we implement that knowledge uh, and to find the solution of of moving forward. Um, you know the. The, the, the knowledge, even even the scientists now are, are running out of idea on how, you know, how, what they can do um, to minimize the use, uh, you know, you know, to campaign against climate change. Now, uh, universities and even, uh, researchers, you know, they are heading back to the community, to the indigenous people to, to, um, to collect the knowledge from them and how they can use that knowledge uh, uh, to implement the knowledge to mitigate climate change, and there could be uh, you know one one lesson that we can use in in our shipping industry, uh, you know because because our ancestors was uh, was they were really, really you know, successful in in building tools where they, they move cargo across to another island, my moving cargo, how much, you know, um, you know um, this is one of the lessons I, I think for me personally, uh, what I wanted to put forward is for us to know where we come from and where we're heading to, you know, by, um, by, by bringing the past knowledge and how can we implement that moving forward into a, into a clean uh, energy shipping. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, just, just, just to conclude um, my Talanoa this morning, uh, for you know, for um, for uh, one of one of the things that I that I said, it's been in the Fiji Museum. You know, as for us, as a Pacific voyagers, we are on a journey, uh, sailing into an island in the future, and navigating by the values of our ancestral past. Our ancestors understood the health of the ocean reflects on the health of our people. Uh, so when we truly acknowledge this insight, when we are aware of the ex extensive threats to our oceans, and when we care about the future of our children, the only logist logical steps is to create a new vision, a new sustainable sail plan based on the values of interconnectedness, respect, and stewardship. Um, so yeah, um, uh, once again, um, to uh, Maria, thank you very much for the invitations, and uh, to all, all all of you that are present today, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, for listening into uh, uh, to to a um, little bit of of the past of how ancestors have, have, have sailed across the Pacific, and uh, and apologies if if um, you know if if I didn't say much, but there's so many things about the past of, of our ancestors have sailed, uh, have sailed back in the olden days. And, you know, um, even now, I, I, a 10 hours flight, I, I try to put together, um, you know, uh, what I I have to share with you this morning. So when I get in this morning, I only have 30 minutes to put together these couple of slides. And then, and I hope that does make sense in as, as we are gathered here today to find a solution to a clean, um, um, a shipping, uh, energy shipping. Uh, so we, with that being said, uh, Malo Valevu, thank you very much for having me uh, for this session this morning. Thank you. Inakasar Valevu, Captain, thank you so much uh, for the all the work that you're doing. And I know you just got off the flight, which is absolutely crazy. But uh, thank you for making space to come and uh, tell us with us and share your 
reflections from uh, London and the work that you currently do. Indeed, you're right. You know, we, in order to move forward, we need to look to the past, reflect on the present, and move forward to the future. And I think, you know, wind power, um, wind power, and the knowledge of our ancestors is critical in uh, today's time and the global issues that we face on greenhouse gas and you know climate change. So thank you very much for your sharing. Good night, John. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, as fluid as our Talanoa will be, you know, sometimes we go through obstacles and, you know, we have uh, some few technical issues going back and forth right now. But, you know, if you all bear with me and you and we're all in this together, we're going to move forward. Uh, our, our One of our speakers, Dr. Alex, will be is currently finding and navigating his way to the laptop or the computer so that he can join us for Talano. Uh, so when he comes, I will let everyone know and I will bring him into the session. Uh, but, you know, next we're gonna move into the present and it's it's gonna be fluid. We're gonna move present, future, however it goes, but we're gonna move. Um, next, we, we're moving to the present. Now, our first speaker for the present is Miss Maria Sahib. Uh, Maria is a dedicated professional uh, with a passion for sustainable maritime uh, practices and climate action. Uh, she has a career spanning over a decade and she has contributed significantly to the fields of shipping decarbonization, fisheries policy and environmental sustainability. Her journey has taken her from the Marshall Islands to a home country in Fiji. Currently, she serves as the coordinator for the specific block, the negotiating block Six Pack Plus at the IMO negotiations on climate change. Her work in this field uh, of collaborative efforts are instrumental in shaping uh, global policies to combat climate change within the maritime industry. She holds a master's degree in development studies and her thesis focused on the assessment of eco-labeling in the Pacific region with a particular emphasis on Marine Stewardship Council certification. Our next speaker is Dr. Christian de Bukalai. Uh, Dr. Christian is a senior lecturer in culture and climate at the University of Melbourne and Marie Sklodowska Curie, uh, FIAS, FP co-fund fellow in Nece Nece Necessary Utopias at IMERA, the Institute for Advanced Study at IMARSE Universite. Um, throughout his career as an anthropologist of policy, Christian has tried to understand how power and ideology influence governance and regulation. After working on cultural policy for over a decade, he changed tactics to help address the climate crisis and rethink the future of maritime transport by focusing on climate policy. Uh, the constant throughout his research is an attempt to understand how the UN can be simultaneously a dysfunctional group of agencies and at the same time, an organization vital to a flourishing environment uh, on human dignity in the face of an existential planetary climate crisis. His research projects include shipping in the Oceanic Commons, uh, regulation and prefiguration for Climate Works Foundation and UNESCO, and uh, the making of global cultural policy for Australian Research Council. Uh, he has a, a recent book called Trade Winds, A Voyage to a Sustainable Future for Shipping, um, and it's also uh, available in the French translation. Uh, our, he's also a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. And then our final speaker for the present is uh, Ms. Atina Schutz. Atina is a legal and policy researcher with the Micronesian Center for Sustainable Transport. And through this capacity, she assists the negotiating block, the Pacific negotiating block, the Six Pack Plus. Uh, she's uh, also attended the IMO meetings in London as an advisor on the Marshall Islands uh, delegation to both the 14th and 15th intersessional working group on uh, greenhouse gas emission meetings and to the 80th session of the Marine Protection Environment Committee. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the present. Inaka. Um. Thank you, John. Thank you for your uh, kind introduction. Um, and uh, uh, thank you everyone for uh, bearing with us um, and listening into our uh, Talanoa session. 
Um, fantastic to learn about uh, new developments in the heritage, heritage space. Uh, currently, we are engaged in an IMO in support of uh, high ambition for decarbonization uh, of shipping and ensuring an equitable transition and why we are in full support of the work that uh, the International Windship uh, Association is leading there. Um, part of the issue for us at IMO is that all the attention gets focused on the needs of the big shipping and big trade and that that leads very quickly into an um, intense discussion on what the new fuels are going to be to drive the big ships. Wind as a propulsive energy is often ignored or it would be without the constant um, lobbying of the people like Gavin and I, uh, IWSA. Yet we know that for the Pacific scale shipping, especially in the trade wind belt, either side of the equator, wind is definitely a large part of our solutions um, going forward. Uh, shortly um, after our theme, uh, in the future theme, Aileen is going to give you a snapshot about what the Marshall Islands have been doing to prepare for a decarbonized future uh, where wind plays a big future. Uh, my task now is to give you a quick overview of the work that has been uh, going on in uh, preparing for this transition. Uh, while new innovations in world shipping are coming thick and fast, it has been uh, slow going for low carbon shipping in the Pacific. Um, despite shipping being central to every facet of our lives as large ocean states, it remains largely uh, into the too hard basket and still well down the long list of regional priorities. Uh, we need to get greatly accelerate uh, we need to accelerate our efforts here at home now. Um, if we can't or won't, then the risk of the rest of the world transitioning uh, while we remain shackled uh, to an ever more expensive diesel dependency simply increases by the day. Um, as Seta has uh, reminded us, only a few generations ago, the Pacific uh, had no shipping crisis. It excelled in large fleets of indigenously designed, owned, and operated vessels, uh, each tailored to its operating environment, uh, sustainably built and renewable uh, energy powered. Every large bay has at least, uh, at least one large ship and the ocean was well-traveled, highway connecting many scattered cultures and communities. Uh, we were an ocean of sail, uh, but today we are the we are more like an ocean of rusty wrecks, burning diesel we can't afford. Uh, today, hopefully, we have finally woken up to the reality that we cannot continue to burn oil and survive, and the price of oil is back to record high, and we can't afford anyway. Um, so, if a paradigm shift of the speed and scale needed to maintain a 1.5 agenda is to be achieved, uh, we will need to move at serious pace and scale. So in the next few minutes, I want to take you through our thinking of what the theory of change for, te for the technology revolution needed might look like. Um, next slide, please. So our work at MCST in the shipping se sector has two broad, uh, broad approaches. At IMO and other international fora, the, uh, the Marshall Islands joins other Pacific and climate vulnerable voices in the call for all major emitting sectors to take all possible action um, to reduce all greenhouse gas emission to the lowest possible limits. The Marshall Islands flag now flies on more than 10% of all world ships. RMI is heavily invested. As the servant of trade, international shipping will be heavily and negatively affected by increasing global warming. Um, the most cost-effective pathways to transition as efficiently as possible starting now. So the longer we delay, the, the greater the global cost uh, is going to be. Uh, our work at IMO in this regard uh, is very important. The levy proposed by RMI and Solomon Islands is the most ambitious market-based measure ever proposed for major emitting sector. Uh, World Bank values this levy uh, 
at generating some 40 to 60 billion dollars of revenue per year, more than enough to pay for the transition actually. Uh, our other major focus is on um, domestic shipping. So the challenge that we are aiming to tackle is to ensuring that our states are not left behind in the global transition for fossil fuel. Uh, as it currently stands, our maritime countries have the world's highest transport connectivity prices, the longest routes, uh, so I think hundreds of miles in between atolls, all fleets, and the narrowest trading economies. Our big task is to transition away from chronic fuel dependency and still provide basic uh, shipping services to our far-flung um, communities. So PBSP is the result of a decade uh, of locally situated research. It is a country-led investment called for a minimum of a half a billion dollars in largely no regrets uh, financing to catalog, uh, catalyze um, a domestic transition in a collective of Pacific countries. Um, first, let me uh, put the technology transition into uh, its proper context. Uh, the needed transition from fossil fuel dependency um, to alternatives in one generation in a sector that's simply not a priority for most countries is greater than anything uh, our Pacific states have ever attempted before. But the urgency of climate change means we have no choice but to attempt it. Uh, achieving the objectives of the PBSP will require a complete uh, technology revolution in our domestic shipping operations. So this includes fuels not yet at market. But the challenge ahead is not just about technology transition. For the first part of our journey, we are reasonably certain we have available technologies we can start with. As I said earlier, wind being an obvious one. Importantly, there are systematic financing and policy barriers that need to be addressed. Implementing the PBSP will require a paradigm shift, shift uh, in program delivery, uh, in governance, and in how we uh, use public financing. But that's a conversation for another session. Our research is that the Pacific requires a bespoke solution. We assume that transition is not a simple process of scaling down internationally proven, proven solutions and applying at specific scale. Uh, Pacific domestic vessels must service extremely thin and long routes. They must be in small, given um, small in size, um, given the transport demand, but able to operate as a full blue water craft to extreme weather conditions and budgeted within the constraints of Pacific island economies and labor markets. Uh, the Pacific domestic operating scenario is sufficiently unique to warrant development of a bespoke theory uh, of change. So the global shipping is embarking on its greatest technology revolution since the invention of the steam driven screw. A range of technologies is being researched, developed, and increasingly deployed. Each week comes new announcements from first movers and market innovators. Obviously, these technologies uh, are at all different levels of technical readiness. Some at market, others only at concept stage. But almost all research is focused on uh, large shipping and trading economies. Very little work has been focused on specific scale shipping technologies. And we have done the initial work on identifying which of these technologies will be of most value in a domestic specific shipping scenario. But there's still a lot, of, a lot of work to do. Next slide, please. So research to support implementation of PBSP has been going for a decade, as I mentioned. The first and hardest job was to simply get the issues visible in the policy space. For a multitude of reasons, uh, shipping has lagged behind every other energy and emitting sector. It's simply been invisible. The timeline on the right shows the various policy milestones we have achieved in the past decade, from the Samoa pathway uh, in 2014 through to full inclusion in our updated NDCs. There is now uh, finally general recognition um, that we must take on this hard to abate sector. At national level in RMI and in Fiji, uh, we have set 
uh, targets at 40% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So our research is that the 40% initial savings are available in the short term from a basket of available policy, uh, operational and technology measures, uh, and wind must be a major player. Uh, we cannot get stalled in an endless uh, cycle of guidebooks and scoping studies and pilot projects. Um, sufficient knowledge is held to move on now to portfolios of uh, coordinated proof of concept trials of identified lead technologies, including new builds and retrofits. Next slide, please. Uh, thanks, Amy. We have also identified and, and have researching uh, have been researching a range of technologies that are not yet fully mature. Several of these uh, have strong potential to prove to be game changers if the technology is successfully brought to market in the near future. Uh, we continue to build research partnership with such technology developers uh, and to monitor their development. For example, we have done this with the Flatner rotor technology with leading innovators in uh, Germany, Windships and Otec in Korea, um, e-ferries and tugboats in uh, New Zealand. Next slide, please. So PBSP is a catalyst for a program of ongoing work. It is not a project. It's about building a long-term transition. And as such, we require upfront and real commitment. We have identified four foundation measures that are elemental investments. The first and most critical research, uh, uh, the first and most critical uh, rather is research and uh, education. It is essential to build long-term my apologies, uh, this someone's speaker is on. Um, yeah, so it is essential to build long-term retained in-country capacity and is required uh, across the sector from cadet to sailors to ministers. Um, next slide, please. Investment in new and high technology, high quality technologies or incentives to improve operational efficiencies will be largely pointless without the capacity to install, service and maintain vessels in region. Um, having to move over next generation ships, thousands of miles to get to a few old and end of service life slipways is not efficient. Transitioning our shipping and maintaining our shipping must go hand in hand and be planned uh, for early. The issues of lack of accurate, reliable data for our sector in the Pacific are legend. How will we know if we are successful without the data? Data includes the capacity to acquire, analyze, maintain, and store. Capacity includes the costs of training and retaining skilled personnel. It is our third foundation measure. And all of it requires a skilled and retained public and private sector capacity. Our government maritime services are already heavily strained uh, despite our small size. We still need to maintain all the regulatory and governance functions a large economy does. We need to value, upscale, upskill and retain a competent modern maritime workforce across the sector if we are to be successful. With our foundation measures in place, uh, then the period between now and 2030 is mapped out with policy interventions to incentivize the transition, which includes customs and duties, uh, tools and restrictions on vessel imports, and then a coordinated portfolio of uh, designs and technologies at TR7 and above uh, for proof of sector trials, uh, and the last an active research and development program for less proven measures and ongoing technology and knowledge transfer with our international partners. With adequate and uh, appropriate investment, uh, the initial RMI Fiji NDC targets are achievable. 
uh, with available policy, operational and technology measures, moving past this, moving on to the light blue path and achieving full decarbonization will ultimately require access to alternative fuels and technologies not yet in market. So this, the choice of such alternatives uh, for specific deployment is far from clear and will take a much more detailed and in-depth study. In the meantime, our primary function must be in maximizing efficiency. The technologies that we have at, have at hand, our ongoing investment in research, development, but most importantly, deployment of working vessels will be essential to determine appropriate specific pathways. Um, next slide, please. So this takes us full circle. If we're committed to a real transition to low carbon shipping, then it is going to take real investment across the sector. Our delegations at IMO are slow, more slowly than we would like, bringing a real carbon price into effect at IMO. The byproduct is significant revenue generation. Again, our delegates have been persistent um, in ensuring the real needs of our seats are at the forefront of the negotiations. But the challenge is now on us here at home to ensure all political capital results in real change to decarbonize shipping for domestic fleets. Our partnership with Gavin, with IWSA, is one more step along that journey. I thank you all for listening. Komal Tata and Binakawa Kalibu. Over to you, John. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, for your excellent uh, sharing. Uh, I now pass it over to uh, uh, Dr. Christian de Bukalai. And I've just gotten word that uh, Dr. Alex Moe will be joining us right before 12.30 in about 20, 25 minutes. So that's good to know. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Thank you very much, um, John, for the um, introduction and the entire team for the invitation. It's um, it's a pleasure to be here. And what I was asked to do is is to kind of, um, in a sense, comment on some of the the work I've been do doing as as a researcher on the revival of sailing cargo ships. And don't be fooled by the initial image that you see of a large um, fossil fuel powered container ship, there is a sailing cargo ship right in front of it as well. But as you will see, it is tiny. And that is um, part of the challenge that we're dealing with right now, is that the existing sailing cargo ships are far, far smaller than the existing fossil fuel powered cargo ships. And that's, of course, not just a challenge of, you know, some sort of a biblical David and Goliath, um, but it's also um, something that really calls into question um, both the speed of the transition and the scale of the industry that really needs to be transformed. And it is that scale in combination with that speed that really poses a massive issue for which as it happens, and um, I'm sure Gavin will, will agree with me here, wind-powered vessels are really something that, that can help. It's um, it's really been beautiful to hear Satraki's um, kind of engagement with the history of vessels in the Pacific. But what I'm offering here is, is a, an account of my research that offers a bit of a, an Atlantic counterpoint to what is happening in the Pacific. So in 2020, I joined the ship that you see here, the Aventure, um, in Tenerife to sail across um, the, uh, not the Pacific, to sail across the Atlantic um, to the Caribbean, where the ship would pick up a cargo of you know, basically luxury goods for the European market namely coffee, rum, and cacao. And um, 
That vessel is a, is a kind of a proof of concept run by a German shipping company called Timber Coast that has the intention of investing and, and building um, modern sailing cargo ships. But this is the ship that they're currently operating because that's the ship they were able to find and, um, and, and purchase at the start of their operations. And all of this is as a way to show that sailing cargo ships are not only a possibility, but can also be a reality today and effectively are because this ship has been in operation um, as a sailing cargo ship under the current owner for nearly 10 years now. But even prior to that, this ship has actually got a very long history of operating as a sailing um, cargo ship throughout the 20th century. And there's only been a short period where it was in use as, you know, something other than a, a cargo vessel, which makes it quite unique. But all of that, of course, calls into question whether or not this really is a feasible option. And what we see is that on this, on this route that we took, it is possible, but it poses some challenges. And those challenges are mo mostly due to the build of the ship and the hull not being particularly well suited to the route that we took and the um, the size of the hold being not particularly well suited for such a long um, ocean crossing. Because what happened is that not only um, was the trip of, you know, or, or that, that I took extended quite significantly because of the COVID pandemic, we were also... Um, we, we also got stuck for quite a while in the Gulf of Mexico, trying to get out against the wind and against the current, which is very difficult um, in a flat bottom chip that doesn't sail into the wind very easily. And at the same time, because of the very limited cargo hold, uh, cargo hold space on the vessel, what we were carrying was a grand total of 65 metric tons of um, cargo, which is, of course, a very small amount of goods, considering that we were 15 people on board taking, you know, nearly 200 days of for the entire trip, of which I was on board for about 150 days, which is all incredibly labor intensive, incredibly costly and quite tricky to do. And of course, it, it, it you know, as you can see, the, the, the space that was reserved for cargo on this vessel was really quite limited. And that's something that is really changing with the newly designed vessels, like um, the ship that Michael Vass, who will present later, has designed for the Marshall Islands, as the much, you know, smaller outrigger vessels that are in use and are being developed further for intra, uh, intra atoll um, transport in the Pacific. And um, some of the really big modern sailing vessels that are designed and being built and are currently um, entering operation, um, you know, from a variety of shipping companies across um, Europe. So this is, of course, a way of showing that it is possible, but going back to ships that are over 100 years old, as, 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 as is the case for this one, um, poses real challenges. But even so, what it shows is that the techniques in terms of running sailing ships, the, 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 this, you know, how you operate and how you man, how you handle a sailing ship um, to use and harness the wind as the primary source of propulsion, the basic ideas behind that haven't changed. So using these old vessels to train the crews that will, um, you know, operate the newer vessels can be a really great way of maintaining um, a continuity of heritage, but also to train up um, new crews for the future. But of course, beyond looking at how we propel ships, there's always the question of the scale at which we operate and the speed at which we operate. Because it looks like not only do we have to replace the current 11 billion tons of cargo that is being transported over sea um, or by ships every single year today, we also have to prepare for a future in which we'll likely see a doubling or tripling of that amount of cargo um, on a, you know, adding up to over 20, uh, over 20 or over 30 
um, billion tons of cargo a year by 2050. So we shouldn't only think about how we sh how we transport these things, but also just how much more we can possibly um, keep on carting around in order to um, push global trade. Because on the one hand, there is a real need to transport cargo over the sea in order to meet people's um, you know, daily and absolutely vital needs. But there is a need to also reconsider exactly how much need to be needs to be shipped. And I think that's also very much part of what we're trying to do here in thinking about you know, using things differently, using labor differently, using ships differently, and in doing so, um, you know, experiencing the real limits of, um, you know, all, all the labor, all the effort, all the planning that has to go into transporting goods, and perhaps reconsidering how much of that needs to be shipped when things get potentially more difficult or more um, more costly. And of course, the objective of the transition that we're in is to ensure that we operate a very smooth zero emission industry that can uh, cater to everyone's needs, but that might involve a recalibration of where and what we ship, um, which could actually see more goods going in and out of um, the Pacific Islands and some um, parts of the world, including um, Europe and Australia, where I'm based, uh, might actually have to do with a little bit less. So that's kind of um, a very brief glimpse of some of the work I've been doing at sea. After that trip on the Aventure, I've started looking into what's happening in the Pacific and a whole lot more and have been um, you know, trying to help out the, um, the, the six-pack um, coalition in their work at the IMO and have visited the Marshall Islands as well. And I hope that I'll be able to contribute to um, that transition further. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Christian. Uh, a reminder, if we could all please uh, mute our microphones during the presentations, that would be great. Appreciate it. Uh, if you could please mute your microphone. Naka. Uh, we now move to our next speaker, uh, Atina. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, everybody, for that uh, really great, <clears throat> great introduction and for a, a great uh, preceding presentation. Uh, apologies, but my camera for some reason cannot turn on. So uh, anyway, I'll just go ahead. But uh, my my presentation for you all will basically focus on what's happening right now at the International Maritime Organization. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to... Um, uh, first, let's talk about the IMO. The IMO is a, the UN Specialized Agency for Regulating Shipping, for those who are not aware. And the IMO is also uh, where, for almost a decade, a group of high-ambition Pacific countries, nicknamed the Six Pack, have been advocating for high-ambition outcomes for um, uh, for the for, from the shipping industry. The industry accounts for up to 3% of emissions globally, and if it were a country, it would be the sixth largest emitter. For the Pacific region, shipping is a lifeline. Without it, we wouldn't have access to the crucial goods and energy that we need to power our economies and provide for the people. But decarbonization is also very costly and highly technical. And it's something that uh, would be very difficult for our respective governments to foot the bill for, you know, especially if we have to deal with other costs such as uh, running a country and responding to climate change impacts. It's also hard to convince the entire shipping industry to switch to alternative fuels uh, when these alternative fuels are also highly costly and not up to the market scale. Whereas the current fuel source, which is heavy fuel oil, is you know very, very cheap. So it's the most economical fuel that we have. There's also consensus 
uh, within the IMO that market-based measures can be effective tools to incentivize decarbonization and increase the uptake of alternative fuel sources. Uh, so, you know, responding to that, RMI and Solomon Islands pr uh, propose a, uh, a GHG levy of $100 per ton of CO2 equivalent. And the idea is that this would go into assisting uh, in the research and development of alternative fuels, but also to uh, incentivize the shipping industry to decarbonize and to um, uh, and to assist in um, uh, offsetting the disproportionate negative impact that arises from having such a measure in place. Uh, so in July of this year, the IMO adopted the 2023 IMO strategy on the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from ships, where the IMO member states committed to reducing global emissions by at least 20% by 2040 and at least 70% by 2050. Also noteworthy to mention is the commitment to a just and equitable transition of the shipping industry and uh, a clear provision in the strategy that ensures a just and equitable transition that leaves no state behind when developing measures to decarbonize the industry. Additionally, the Marshall Islands also introduced the term equitable transition. Under an equitable transition, there needs to be an equitable access to the benefits of decarbonization, technical assistance and technology sharing, and very importantly, financing to decarbonize our domestic fleet, but also to address our general climate aims. A commitment to an equitable transition means agreeing to adopt differential treatment between states in terms of the revenue disbursement of revenues that comes from implementing the, the GHG strategy. And vulnerable countries already grapple with uh, inequalities in terms of historical emissions, climate impacts and the ability to address climate impacts through mitigation, adaptation and compensation and the need to uh, have a level playing field. So one of the reasons why, well, an Hello, Athena, are you there? I think you 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 cut. It seems that our our friend is uh, facing some technical issues uh, from uh, the Marshall Islands. Hopefully she should join soon. In that case, I will give her space. Uh, I will give her space later when she joins back. Um, apologies, everyone, for these few hiccups that are going on right now. Uh, but I thank you all for your understanding. Uh, having that said, we now move to we will now move to the future part of our our webinar, and uh, our first speaker is Eileen Sefeti. Eileen uh, is uh, of both uh, Brutuman and Fijian descent, raised and brought up in Majuro, the Marshall Islands. Uh, she served as a research assistant and the acting project coordinator for the Center for Vocational and Continuing Education, CVCE, at the University of the South Pacific, uh, Marshall Islands campus from 2017 to early 2019. She went on to serve as the Administrative Assistant and Budget Officer at the Embassy of the Republic of the Marshall Islands in Suva, uh, Fiji from 2019 to 2023. While serving at the Embassy, she was pulled in to work with the technical team for MCST in 2020 to help provide support to uh, Ambassador Alban Ishoda, uh, the Ambassador to uh, the Marshall Islands Ambassador to Fiji then, uh, who led uh, RMI shipping uh, decarbonization efforts at the regional and international forum. She currently is part of the MCST support team and served uh, as the outreach coordinator and project director backup and the special envoy on maritime decarbonization for the Marshall Islands from 2022 till present. Eileen is now transitioning over to serve as the MCST UNF project director. Our next speaker for the future is Captain Professor Michael Vass. Uh, since 2000, he was appointed as Professor for Ship Operation and Simulation at Hochschule Emden Lier, 
University of Applied Sciences, uh, and has graduated in maritime transport from Hamburg Polytechnical Institute in 1989, and then undergone a career in the merchant marine on various types of ships up to the captain's position. After three years of studying uh, maritime education and training, he was appointed as maritime lecturer and qualified for professor's appointment in 2000. At university, at the university, his field of research has been strongly related to green shipping, in particular, the development and operation of sail systems for cargo ships. Since 2017, he was the honorary professor at the University of the South Pacific Micronesian Center for Sustainable Transport, research on ship operations and efficiency. From 2017 to 2019, he was a visiting professor at Western Norway University of Applied Sciences, Hogesund Lectures, and research on green shipping, low carbon shipping. Since 2021, the captain has been the co-chair of the new Fraunhofer uh, Research Unit, Sustainable Maritime Mobility at Fraunhofer IWES, Bremerhaven and Hochschule Emden, Lier in Germany. Uh, and then our final speaker will be Mr. Gavin All Allright, of which I uh, introduced his bio in the beginning of our webinar. Without further ado, the future. Thanks, John. Thank you to our um, presenters. You have already given us a lot to think about. Um, it is my pleasure to be here to, to share some thoughts about what the future of wind shipping might look like. Um, as John has mentioned, my name is Aileen Sifeti, and uh, I've just been recently appointed as the project director for MCST. And uh, a large part of my job now is uh, coordinating the support of the SIGPAC Plus and the um, high-level negotiations at IMO over how fast and how equitably we can decoupled. Those negotiations are incredibly important. After many years, we finally get to the part of the negotiation about um, the money and the implementation of the IMO strategy. The negotiations become ever more technical and complex. And um, Atina was in the process of giving a brief background on that, but she got cut off. Um, hopefully she'll be able to join me again later. But it's also really refreshing in this session to be able to focus back on the um, Pacific and our transition and to be able to do some thinking about the future of wind shipping for our countries. My take home from the first session on the past was that our ancestors were not afraid of a challenge. They designed for minimal resource basis, some of the most advanced around naval architecture, and maritime engineering to come up with um, some of the fastest, most efficient, and most sustainable ships in the world without metal. And with these ships um, and advanced knowledge of navigation, they colonized the great, greatest ocean on the planet under sail. At the top of um, at the top end of high performance sail technology today, with boats um, doing fifty knots, it is easy to see the influence of our culture and heritage have had in this field. So a large part of the future missions is to relearn how to harness um, the knowledge our ancestors learned for the new challenges ahead. Heritage um, revitalization is a critical part of our future, especially for us in the Pacific. Um, in terms of practical application at country level, the SVQI for many years was our sole representative of sail-based um, cargo operating on the ocean. It is now a decade since we sat down with our partners at Hochschule um, Emden Lair to design a, a pilot program to build a modern choir. This year, I was proud to um, be at the key lane ceremony in Guji Island uh, in Busan, in Korea. That was in May. And this is the product of a five years design work um, under the German funded GIZ project. It's a major step forward, but it is only one step in a long journey. Uh, next slide, please. The sad reality is that we should have dozens of new boats in production by now. Unfortunately, the regional priorities over the past decade have simply not included. Shipping the alternative energy or infrastructure budgets of other sectors. 
Shipping remains a very marginal business case. It is almost impossible to ensure local shipping, and there is almost no commercially available investment finance. This is why um, the IMO negotiations over equitable transition and revenue disbursement are so important for us. Without a carbon price on international shipping, we are unlikely to, ha to ever have the financing for our states to transition effectively. Next slide, please. In envisaging the future we want, we need to have a vision and a plan for what we want and how we get there. For RMI, the vision is set out in our updated NDC, a complete reduction of emissions by 2050 with 40% achieved by 2030. We set the 40% milestone based on what was achievable with existing technology, wind in particular. Uh, the plan is uh, Revelab 2050, which is our cabinet approved natural framework for uh, transport decarbonization. This framework is the first national action plan submitted by any SIDS to IMO. It calls for action internationally and domestically. At the core of um, Revelab 2050 is a series of uh, research work streams of policy, education, heritage, data, economics uh, and technology interwoven with common principles of partnerships, knowledge exchange, and participatory learning. Revelab 2050 gives us a chart and a course for the future. Here's what it looks like in practice. On the left-hand side um, is the international advo advocacy side of our journey. Here we work with other Pacific High Ambition states and backstop by um, international research partners to advance a 1.5 aligned equitable transition at IMO and related forum. And um, we have a common objective with um, IWSA in ensuring all support is brought to in advance a wind powered shipping agenda at all speed. We have about 2,000 large ships and many thousands of small boats to replace in the next 25 years. Wind hybrid propulsion and uh, wind energy are going to be integral to that for all our states. On the right is the future we are trying to build at home. I already discussed the Kwai who we started working with by sending one of Professor Vass interns to measure the fuel consumption in 2015. And now the new ship being built in Korea, which I'm told will be more than 7% efficient than a normal diesel vessel. Uh, Mr. Elson Kellen and Juan Island in Mayo continue to lead our heritage revitalization of Marshallese canoe culture and steadily advance wind powered shipping at, at all level. We continue to work with new and old partners in Korea on um, emerging technologies like uh, WIG craft and OTEC and industry partners like Swire, GMF, um, on commercial applications of new shipping technologies. Again, this is, it's all about the partnerships. Next slide, please. Um, in this last slide, I wanted to just touch on some of the ideas we have been working on for the future. In recent work with um, Australian Defense Force, Think Tank AP4D, they are recommending Australia consider funding a fleet of low carbon ferries for the Pacific in uh, in much the same manner as they provide the current fleet of garden class patrol vessels. We think this is a great suggestion, but it would be even better if they funded the rebuilding of Pacific shipbuilding capacity like Fiji had 30 years ago, so that they could then contract Pacific shipbuilders to build Pacific ships. In the example on the left of the slide, we were asking what um, the additional cost per vessel would be to commission a fleet of our friend um, Derek Allard sail freighters if it included setting up the yard in the Pacific. Uh, okay, if we can't, sorry, oh sorry, if we can't build ships in the Pacific, then surely we should be looking to build a long-term relationship with someone who can. Can we work long term with a reputable yard in a rim country where we can send Pacific shipwrights for work and training? While it is fantastic to see the first ship built, we need to build a whole fleet. And then there are the large ships which we will never build in the Pacific. For this, we need new business model and new technologies. 
the new line ship being built in France today is one possible solution. And at the bottom of the slide is the new hospital ship Japan recently donated to our mine. We are of course incred incredibly grateful to get this ship, but it would be even better to have a low carbon version of it for the future. I've also added a few more wing ships flying around um, just because we really want to see them in action in the near future. Um, John, I hope these um, thoughts have been useful and um, we really are very grateful to Gavin and um, I IWSA. They have been a strong part of our formation and we know they are an equally strong part of our future as well. So with that being said, um, this brings me to the end of my short presentation on the future and uh, como tada. Over to you, John. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Eileen, for that. And yes, indeed, very, uh, very helpful for us. Uh, I now uh, give space to uh, Captain Professor Michael Vass. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. And Maria and, and the team all behind. And I'm really happy um, that you invited me for this and to be part of this high ambition community for sustainable sea transport. And I would like to share some ideas and of course some slides. I will try to share the screen. Hope this will work out. <clears throat> awesome. Let me know if you, yeah, yeah. Can you see it? Well, yeah. oh, that's that's fine. Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, so um, talking about the future, new technologies, potentials for climate neutral shipping. Uh, first of all, um, this is where I'm coming from, uh, the University of Emden Lea and the, uh, the Fraunhofer Working Group for Sustainable Maritime Mobility. And what we're doing is uh, <clears throat> research work from lab to pilot systems. Um, so all the way long from the first uh, investigation, for example, in a wind tunnel or in a in a towing tank, uh, carrying on with uh, numerical methods, with uh, ship maneuvering simulators, until um, there is uh, the pilot system on board a ship, um, and uh, the system can be tested and evaluated. Yeah, so we know the problem. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I, I got rather quickly over this, uh, but um, <clears throat> we knew, of course, that uh, the ambition is rising and uh, that MEPC uh, has brought about uh, uh, more ambition and a climate goal um, of uh, going down to zero around 2050, which is uh, good and amazing and certainly um, uh, due to uh, not the least the hard work of the uh, six pack um, group. Uh, so congratulations uh, for this uh, real great success. Yeah, so I, I would like to uh, talk about a bit about striking uh, tech news. So of course the focus is on, on uh, wind propulsion, but um, at least in, in modern shipping and when the uh, <clears throat> global economy will not really change much, then, of course, we have to see that the wind propulsion will never be alone, but in combination with other technologies. And uh, this is uh, at the moment a big question. What will we see in the future as a redundant propulsion um, <clears throat> and I found this uh, very amazing, this uh, in China built uh, container ship of around 700 TU. So this is a quite uh, medium sized uh, container ship, um, which is operated uh, solely on, on battery. And um, 
the battery is on board uh, in containers. So, so 36 containers can be stowed in the aft uh, of the ship and give uh, the ship uh, enough power to sail around 600 nautical miles, which is amazing. And uh, I find this amazing if you see the progress. Yeah, so I just noted down that in 2015, we had the first full electric battery ferry, Ampere, with a battery capacity of one megawatt hour. Uh, five years later, another ferry, Ellen in, in Denmark, um, with 4.3 megawatt hour. And now only three years later, uh, we see this container ship Hyundai 15 with 50 megawatt hours. So that's a tremendous growth. And um, I think um, we see some kind of a leap in technology and um, uh, batteries um, can be interesting for the future and interesting technology at the moment. It seems uh, a technology for short sea shipping, uh, but I think there is a lot potential, uh, and uh, yeah, it will be uh, um, exciting to see uh, this technology further develop in the future. Another striking news uh, was uh, uh, the mask ship uh, put into service, the Laura Mask. Um, um, an even bigger ship uh, with 2,100 TUs. Um, battery technology for this big ship uh, and uh, long distance trade is not possible at the moment and uh, for the next uh, years or decade. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, the case for green fuels. Um, Mask has decided for methanol as a green fuel, a liquid fuel. Uh, one of uh, yeah, the more simple solutions, um, but could be very effective. And um, the interesting and positive thing about this project is that Mask is one of the ship owners, the large ship owners, one of the leading ship owners in the world that is taking over responsibility and taking care of uh, the availability of fuel for their ships uh, in the future. And this is probably the biggest challenge, as we can say, or as we can see a general basic thesis that green fuels will be expensive and uh, there will be a limited availability. So you will not have uh, green fuels everywhere in the world available at any time in any quantity. Um, so that will be interesting how this will develop uh, a big challenge. Green fuels production has to be run up uh, in the yeah. next decades. Um, and Mike, sorry. Will... I'm sorry to cut. I think your slides are not moving. Ah, they are not moving. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I I go back in, in this uh, mode. Um, can you see it now? Yes. Yeah, so sorry about that. Um, okay, so then we uh, go on uh, with, uh, yeah, so one of the uh, very interesting uh, technologies uh, for future ship propulsion um, <clears throat> all over the world, uh, especially in uh, areas with uh, good wind conditions. Here you can see um, the development 100 years ago, sail power 100%. So this is uh, the Peking, one of the last uh, full cargo ships, 100% uh, uh, on sail power. Uh, and now that seems to be a revival or uh, seems to be there is a revival. Um, <clears throat> but uh, at the moment, um, we are talking more about wind assisted ships. And if we compare um, full sailing ships of the past uh, with 100% power, 100 uh, sail power, we see that wind-assisted ships are at the moment going up to about 25% of sail power. So this is at the moment uh, the limitation, but of course uh, modern innovative sail technology is uh, 
uh, still on the rise. And uh, I think um, we can see uh, much improvement, uh, much surprise in the coming years. Here you see some pictures. Uh, the the e-ship uh, one on the top right is uh, now 13 years in operation with Flettner rotors. The Flettner rotors have more than 40,000 running hours, successful running hours, reliable running hours. So this is uh, more than, this is about five years nonstop running the system. Uh, it is amazing. It is really a, a reliable, robust technology. We experienced, uh, I think in the recent weeks, um, we saw new technologies uh, coming on the market, uh, the bar uh, wing sail technology in the middle, um, and the the uh, the French ocean wing, a textile ocean wing. So they are now um, <clears throat> under trial, um, and uh, it will be interesting um, what will come out at the end uh, in terms of performance, reliability. Um, <clears throat> So we are looking forward for this. Yeah, so I like the simple things. Uh, this is one of our university projects. You see a, a ship like there are thousands of in the world. Uh, and all of them have available space on the foredeck, on the so-called forecastle, where you can put uh, a sail device, in this case a flatner rotor. So uh, you can do many things with the technology we have available. So uh, a large proportion of uh, world uh, fleet uh, could be even retrofitted with systems like this. And they are running so simple and so reliable. Here on the left, you see the automatic uh, control system. And um, yeah, that's uh, really, um, um, really nice feeling if you have wind systems that work automatically on their own. Yeah, then there is always the uh, the big question: um, what makes the difference between these all uh, between these various uh, technologies? Um, <clears throat> yeah, very interesting question. Um, you can tackle this question scientifically. I just uh, put a performance uh, diagram uh, here as an example, uh, where you can see the the the. Uh, green curve um, um, with a high slope, which indicates um, much uh, aerodynamic performance per area, um, which is um, um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why Flettner rotors are at the moment uh, very successful and promising. But uh, the whole story is very, very complex, a very, very complex question which technology um, is superior and um, probably we don't have a single answer. We have to look um, precisely at the ship, at the transport task, at the prevailing conditions, boundary conditions, and uh, mostly come up uh, with some case by case uh, optimum system. Yeah, so the um, decision drivers for ship owners are mainly performance, but this is not all of it. Yeah, this is important and uh, in interesting for discussion. I, I know that uh, uh, in the Pacific Islands, uh, people like to discuss about performance on, on, on sail systems. You can have uh, nice talks. Uh, uh, instantaneously on sale performance, um, <clears throat> but in the economic world, there are more decision drivers like robustness, maintenance uh, of the system. So the system must run reliably uh, for a long time, especially where you have uh, remote locations and cannot call the service at any moment. Uh, this is a very important driver for the decision automation high system availability and the compatibility with cargo and ship operation are uh, uh, very important uh, aspects. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the savings uh, potential, fuel or time. And finally, and I think this is uh, one of the, or this is probably in the economic world, the most important decision driver 
uh, the cost structure, where we have the investment, where we have the maintenance cost, and where we can come out at the end if we have sufficient data with uh, perhaps uh, a cost model where we calculate the cost per kilowatt hour uh, uh, propulsion power of a ship uh, that is being generated by the sail device. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, um, we have many systems um, coming up on the market uh, being under trial where we don't have reliable figures now so that will take a little time so you cannot put a sales system into operation and then next day uh, present figures um, you need let's say months or better a whole year for operation to come up with reliable figures and that's probably at the moment a little shortcoming for uh, ship owners um, that um, um, available data and trusted data um, is um, not at hand about all systems. Of course, there are other requirements. Um, a green image um, seems to be um, an important driver as well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, now we are coming uh, to one um, um, project uh, we heard already a little bit about uh, I can uh, talk hours about this project and get quite enthusiastic this is the uh, the new um, sail cargo ship for the Marshall Islands um, I, on the right side you see some pictures from the general arrangement plan and some artists impression and uh, the state of uh, construction on the shipyard in Goje in South Korea. So steel is, um, uh, I would say, around uh, 95 or 98 percent completed. Ship will be ready in February, March uh, delivered. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, GIZ, uh, the, the German uh, International uh, Corporation and uh, the Environmental Ministry funded this uh, climate protection project uh, for a tailor-made uh, Pacific Island supply and a cargo vessel where all the experience of um, Pacific shipping from the Marshall Islands shipping company was put into this uh, design. So this design built up on experience on the existing fleet. So there is not a, a break in but it is a, a development to build on the existing, which uh, um, um, has done well service for many years and, and decades, uh, but um, um, putting this uh, into a new age of technology. So uh, our predictions um, expect 80% um, fuel savings by uh, a sales system, um, um, the so-called Indosail type uh, system, which uh, was uh, created by uh, Peter Schenzle about 30 years ago. I, I think Peter Schenzle is in the audience, so uh, he will be happy to see this, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there are many other technical um, um, innovations, uh, photovoltaic uh, recuperation of the propeller uh, with the uh, when there is uh, sufficient sail power. So many, many things, uh, as I said, I can keep on talking um, for hours, uh, but uh, uh, we'll come to the uh, most important information. So there will be an open ship event in February, March in 2024 in Gochi in South Korea. Uh, and I think this uh, ship is really worth uh, visiting and having a look when it's uh, uh, ready uh, for service. And I hope that uh, there will be interested uh, ship owners uh, and that we will see more of this type or with uh, some adaptations, that's no problem in the future. So please note down Mar February, March 2024, uh, the project team will be happy to present the ship then. Yeah, so we're coming to the end. Uh, Wind-assisted hybrid ships, short-term, we see them. 
more and more. Uh, perhaps the question, is there more wind propulsion possible? Uh, something what we call, call wind ships with uh, perhaps even over 50% uh, of wind propulsion. Um, yeah, so we are excited about this idea and have to work hard on the developments that we come to this point of wind ships. And uh, of course, we see the chances and risk for ship owners and managers, shipbuilders, suppliers in regard to the transformation. Um, I would see the main risk in not taking the chance uh, to go this way, to go this path. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening and um, hopefully we can talk a bit about this. Thanks, John. Back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Michael Vaz. Thank you for your sharing. And, you know, uh, I think earlier, I think like months ago, it was really good to see to see you and the team and the, and the ship that was being built. So, you know, having to see that firsthand, you know, and listening to, you know, the work that you're doing um, there in South Korea is really helpful for the Marshall Islands and for the region as well. And it, you know, it gives opportunities for the Pacific to, you know, to adapt these measures. So thank you very much for your sharing. Uh, now I I would like to uh, hand it over to Mr. Gavin Allright, and then we will uh, go finally to um, Dr. Alex Moya. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, I'm just going to share my screen if I can. Um, just better get that up. So, just one moment. Let me see. Yeah, here we go. So, um, it's it's my great pleasure to come after such fantastic uh, presentations and and so many of the of the aspects that I wanted to touch on have already been expertly covered. So. I think my presentation will be quite short, uh, but just really focusing on that future and uh, the, the, the Pacific Technology Hub, of, of course, the wind propulsion hub that we're developing. And hopefully we'll be able to do the signing of the MOU, but um, just really powerful messages from, from, from everybody here. And what I wanted to focus on is that IWSA, um, we declared decade of wind propulsion now that sounds a, bit, a little strange when i'm saying it in the south pacific like, what about the last couple of millennia but what we're really talking about here is that uh the the modern wave of wind propulsion coming back into the market um we've been talking a good a a, a, a good amount of technology we've been talking about design for many many years and we really saw that 2020, 2021 was the point where we had to, and the, the key word here is deliver, deliver on all of that potential and all of that um, uh, momentum that was growing. And really over the last eight, uh, two years now, um, we've seen that momentum really growing. Um, and as, as a, 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 a sort of network of uh, covering uh, many different aspects of wind propulsion. You know, we we really see that transition being, uh, or uh, or the, the the movement towards wind propulsion being in sort of three different phases. And we've heard um, each of the speakers today touching on uh, various aspects. So the uh, the first area is a sort of a tweaking of the existing fleet that we have. So retrofitting, uh, putting putting uh, you know, uh, sails on. Uh, tankers, bulkers that are already in operation. Then we we see another thread or another theme coming through, which is the transition, where we have uh, new builds being made wind ready or having installations already put in, uh, work on the optimization of those designs. Um, you know, the retrofitting, um, you know, mandating all ships to be wind ready, for example, in the future. And then finally, a, a transformation thread. And uh, I think very much uh, the, the ship that uh, Michael was just talking about, uh, where we have a primary wind vessels, uh, they are maybe quite small at, at present, but growing. Um, but that becomes the de facto, that becomes the, 
the, the new design norm. And we have those energy harvesting systems on board to take advantage of the wind when it's blowing too much and then using that energy to propel the ships of the future that uh, when the wind isn't blowing uh, at all. Now, oh, I'm just going to go on to my next uh, slide. Now, the International Wind Ship Association itself is over 150 active members, and I think we're already over 200 members in total. And, and these numbers are a little bit old. These are, these are a few uh, months ago. Um, and our job is to really facilitate the uptake of wind propulsion worldwide. So in the existing fleet, and I'll talk about where we are with that in a moment, but um, also for you know, laying the groundwork and, and creating the facilitation space for uh, the uh, companies to uh, collaborate, put together joint ventures, work together to actually uh, uh, bring, bring wind propulsion into reality. And one of the factors that we, we uh, saw in that dissemination and that scaling of wind propulsion is around national chapters and clusters or hubs as, as, uh, as we call them. And the, the Pacific Hub is one of about five that we're working on. There's quite an active one in France, on the west coast of France, North America, um, in, in the north of Europe as well, and um, over in uh, uh, Northeast Asia as well. But um, we've been very active with uh, uh, MCST. And I can't believe actually John, John and Maria mentioned the Talanoa, the Sustainable Sea Transport Talanoa, back in 2012, and that makes me that makes me feel a little old. That's 12 years ago, um, and we were talking about these issues then. But we were talking about them, and we weren't able to deliver them yet. Um, that is very much changing, and I've, I've been delighted to see all of the work that uh, the Six Pack have been doing, um, also the the the, uh, the incredible amount of research analysis and and development of national uh, programs and pathways and of course as as maria mentioned very clearly your know, wind has to be really an integral part of the transition especially in this region where we have you know huge distances very expensive fuels and relatively low uh, cargo and passenger uh, uh, volumes as well but that doesn't have to be um just servicing what we have. And this is something that's really important. And I, I think uh, uh, Maria and Eileen both touched on this, um, and Christian as well, is around the uh, the virtuous circle. So the co-design that Michael was, was uh, mentioning, you know, co-designing these uh, the, the, the ships of the future, indigenous knowledge, you know, that Captain said was, you know, really brought that home to all of us, I think. Um, that's incredibly important, but the training, having seafarers from the region operating these vessels where the benefits accrue in, in the islands themselves, but we also see a rejuvenation of perhaps shipbuilding as uh, uh, we, we heard around the, the Fijian yards, which were vibrant in the 70s and 80s, um, but also you know, retrofitting and maintenance uh, cycles can be done there education, research, um, the South Pacific or the Pacific in, in a wider sense is a natural pioneer in this, in this area. And that leadership is already being shown in the IMO. And I think it will be shown more and more in the, the sort of unplugging of the Pacific shipping network from uh, fossil fuel dependency going towards wind, plus energy efficiency measures, plus voyage optimization, and then plugging the, the, the gap for the remaining amount of uh, requirement with the alternative fuels, but delivered at, at the scale that's appropriate for, for the region. Um, and this is my final slide, just a, a, a real vision going forward is um, we, we have a lot of policy pressure um, you know, not just from the IMO, but there's new, new developments. There are developments around the Poseidon principles, sea cargo charter in the industry itself as well. 
not I, I don't believe any one of these is going to be a strong enough driver to get us to 2030 to get us to that 30 percent striving for 30 percent uh, reduction but collectively these are sending a huge message to the industry that the change is already locked in and that the earlier that you change the lower cost that's actually going to be and in a sense the lower risk that that will actually be um, we indeed we take the IMO indicative checkpoints of 20 percent and and uh, the six pack group really fought for that striving for 30 percent but we we really take that as a floor as opposed to a ceiling so building on that 30 percent um, I think the CE Delft report back in July which looked at voyage optimization wind plus some uh, alternative fuel by 2030 could deliver between 28 to 47 percent reduction pretty much with the technologies that are already on the shelf and wind propulsion is is really there um on the forecast that future development well um the eu estimated by 2030 we could have up to 10 uh, 15 percent of the world fleet with some form of wind propulsion on board. The UK government took that one step further, extrapolated out to uh, 2050 and saw between 40 to 45% of the fleet or around about 40,000 vessels would have some form of wind propulsion on board. We believe that both of those are conservative estimates. Um, obviously they're a mix of retrofits and new builds. Um, but how do we get there? Where are we today? And what is the what is the outlook for for wind propulsion? And, you know, uh, within that uh, are the seeds for where the collaboration uh, between uh, MSC, uh, MCST and IWSA are, are really sown. Well, we've got 31 um, uh, large vessels, so vessels over 400 GT um, that have wind propulsion installed. That's around about 2 million dead weight tons of shipping. So it's substantial, but it's still a small, small number. There are another... Oh, sorry, someone's... I think we've got a... a, a so if you could switch off your microphone. Okay, thanks, thanks John. Um, so uh, where was I? Yes, um, so we've got 31 large vessels installed with uh, wind assist system. Um, there's another eight that are wind ready. So new builds that have been delivered with all the foundation work done on those. Um, and there's another 10 small cruise ships um, which are operating with traditional sails on board. We don't usually include those because they're, they're, they're more leisure craft than, than uh, commercial uh, craft but interestingly there are five new build primary wind vessels in in yards being built today including uh, uh, Michael's uh, project as well so those primary wind vessels are coming through we're looking at probably 20 2025 to 2026 being a, a place where we'll have more than just a handful maybe uh, anything between five and ten of those vessels in operation um and just just one last one last point to make is we can also um, look at different business models and i think um, a couple of the speakers talked about this um wind uh, being delivered as a service for example where we have systems that can be lifted on and off the large vessels can actually be leased or um, the savings made by reduction in fuel pays for these systems and we have to remember that we're harnessing a free energy source which will actually pay for itself so um that is uh as we usually say a win 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 situation and i think that uh the the, the collaboration between mcst and iwsa will be another one of those win 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 situations so i'm really looking forward to uh, not just continuing our collaboration, but deepening and uh, strengthening that collaboration going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gavin, for that. Uh, uh, 
I now hand it over to our final speaker for today, um, Dr. Alex Moya. Thank you very much. You know, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, uh, Talano is all about the fluidity. We go to the past, we go to the future, come to the present, and now we're going back to the past. And uh, I give you space, uh, Dr. Alex. Thank you. Um, uh, Ali, half a day, Ranim, Mogathin, Kaslehia, Yakwe, Aloha, Makako. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here, <clears throat> and um, as others have already said, to add voice and chorus of thanks to the Micronesia Center for Sustainable Transport, MCST, and to the IWSA, and to the organizers of this event and the other speakers. As I saw in the chat just moments ago, I've, I've, I've learned some wonderfully um, stimulating and firing up, up new things. I, um, I, won't, I won't talk for too long, and I've, I've got two, two points to bring to the table. Um, one... Uh, slightly a, a, a real, maybe a real turn in the conversation, but a seedling I hope to plant uh, as part of what should be discussed around sustainable sea transport and sustainable futures for Oceania and Oceania's peoples and the world and uh, more more broadly. And the second, uh, the second thought or contribution to our conversation today um, around a new um, digital resource that's just emerged in this space. So um, I'm, I'm coming to you from here at the University of Hawaii Manoa at the Center for Pacific Island Studies, which was founded in 1950 as the world's first Pacific Studies um, MA program and uh, much more recently bachelor's program and uh, now joined by programs across Oceania, including at U University of Auckland, Vic uh, in Wellington, um, colleagues in uh, Tahiti, University of the South Pacific and the uh, community colleges of Micronesia and across Oceania, as well as in the continental United States, are increasingly making spaces for programs which, like the Center for Pacific Island Studies here at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, draw attention to an interdisciplinary um, um, space, social sciences, natural sciences, for advancing conversations that, uh, um, that will help meet the needs of uh, Oceania's peoples and communities towards resilient and sustainable indigenous and Pacifica and Oceanian futures. One of the things that's been very interesting in the conversation this afternoon and this morning um, uh, uh, to track, uh, I guess, depending on where we are, it could be your evening, I suppose, for any, any of you who are on the other side of the uh, other side of this blue green marble world of ours. One of the things that's very interesting in this conversation to track is the way in which uh, uh, sustainable sea transport intersects with and engages with other currents of concern for Oceania's peoples and region. And if we're going to meet the challenge of, of, of increasing adaptive capacity, community resilience, and community well-being for Oceania's peoples, we'll, we'll want to train next generation scholars, including some of those who are here in the, in the room with us today, uh, who are either current or former MAs in Pacific Studies, next generation scholars who are able to articulate between the concerns uh, uh, confronting Pacific peoples, both within sustainable sea transport domains, but between SST and um, neighboring conversations, and not just uh, global climate change and the, the confrontation of, of um, the Anthropocene and peak oil and energy, energy density costs and so on, but conversations around indigenous and um, regional agency, uh, local sovereignty over resources, around community, uh, um, community capacity in a ever-shifting geopolitical climate and so on. There's so many intersectional concerns. So uh, not so much a pitch uh, thought for, for our own university here, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, the, the Research One University here in the state of Hawaii um, and our, our Pacific Studies program here as a general pitch towards looking for students who are not only located in the um, engineering fields and in the uh, uh, primary domains contributing to the material and practical sciences around sustainable sea transport, urban uh, planning and development programs and as well as engineering and so on, but the broad diversity of training fields uh, uh, that will help everyone navigate what is at the end of the day, a very significant ideological and practical shift back towards wind powered transport, which requires shifts in uh, among other things, notions of temporality, notions of uh, uh, connectivity um, between places, speed and so on. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the things that, that that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, this is a lead in, I guess, or a bridge to our um, the, the the main reason that I'm here alongside that um, perhaps that little seedling uh, that we can plant in the loamy soil of the mind that you can ask yourself: Are your research teams and your practice teams are 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 your teams inside your space of practice inclusive 
of scholars who have trained in indigenous or Pacific studies, scholars who've trained broadly in the social sciences, including those who trained outside of um, um, uh, planning, policy, development, or engineering sciences bearing on the implementation or realization of sustainable sea transport um, futures. Um, so this brings us to the uh, second reason I'm here. It's my pleasure on behalf of my colleague, Joe Gens, the University of Hawaii Hilo, and uh, almost 30 co-authors to share news of a very interesting project we worked on last year. Several folks in this room um, joined us in this uh, in drafting this volume. It's the latest volume in University of Hawaii Manoa's um, open access um, um, digital textbook series called Teaching Oceania, which is um, being used across the region in classrooms from Palau to um, Aotearoa to Hawaii, as well as in museums and various other places. This is the latest volume. It just came out a few months ago on voyaging in the Pacific. We have uh, in this teaching series, um, uh, typically we work to bring together scholars, activists, practitioners. In this case, we had uh, uh, Mr. Allison Kellen, uh, Larry Ragatol, uh, Satareki Laduo, who's here with us today, and, and other, other voyaging practitioners, as well as scholars with us in drafting this volume. Peter Nuttall was part of this team. One of the things that I'm, I'm really proud of this volume, which uh, draws attention to synthetically history of voyaging across the region and is available to classrooms, um, at, you know, post-secondary classrooms, university level classrooms um, um, with, uh, you know, sort of rich multimedia access uh, uh, to uh, Polynesian Voyaging Society navigators to uh, uh, Alson or or Larry uh, uh, can speak to Micronesian navigation or Setareki who speaks to Fijian navigation. So as you can see, it should be a beautiful volume. One of the things that we realized uh, on the lead up to this volume is that there have been relatively few discussions of the relationship between traditional or ancestral navigation and voyaging in Oceania and contemporary contemporary navigation concerns like sustainable sea transport. So just in case uh, uh, you're interested, well, we're glad to um, I, um, I'm glad to send a link or I, I, um, I, I, to this volume and this resource if anyone's interested. But um, I, I really want to highlight or identify another angle of this conversation that I heard several people mention, uh, including the speaker just before me. That there's a direct relationship between ancestral and traditional expertise and knowledge around um, post um, post disaster regional networks around meeting the needs of communities in periods of uh, adaptive resilience uh, due to environmental or ecological shifts over uh, um, decadal or, or centennial or millennial time, voyaging networks are sites of extraordinary repositories of regional expertise that, that, that should be engaged as having something to say, not just for cultural renewal or cultural pride or cultural identity, but it has something directly to say to sustainable sea transport and indigenous and sustainable uh, transportation futurities in o Oceania. I won't um, try to go into any of the, 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 the details uh, uh, of, of that argument too much more, and please feel free to follow up. But we wanted to draw attention to this resource, this conversation here, because we think there's still to date relatively few conversations that are exploring uh, this space. Let's see if I can find a better photo. It's exploring this space as deeply as they could, but a great example would be the point I, I, I just drew to. How did Pacific peoples adaptively respond to climate and environmental risks in the past through sea transport networks, through sailing networks that were maintained not as ad hoc systems of sustainable transport, but as culturally encoded and culturally grounded systems that provided adaptive capacity and security to Pacifica communities across millennia? How will we study such things? Probably not through urban development or regional planning or policy programs or through engineering programs, but with our social scientists and interdis interdisciplinary humanities scholars who can work with communities on oral traditions, um, story traditions, on women's knowledge around sustainable uh, prior or past or ancestral sustainable transport and so on. Thanks so much for just the chance to plant a couple seeds. The first, as sustainable sea transport heroes, please look to our regional universities and colleges for how your programs might support researchers across a broad rainbow of degree programs, including Pacific studies. And second, please keep your eye open for resources like our Teaching Oceania, Pacific Voyaging, um, open access digital textbook for how we can advance some of these side conversations that will support the future success of sustainable sea transport revolution in Oceania. Mahalo. Mahalo nui, uh, uh, Dr. Alex. Thank you so much. You know, uh, 
you know, we've reached the top of the hour, but I, I wanted to thank all of you for, you know, being here and listening to all of the the, the lovely presentations that that uh, that were shared. Uh, thank you all to the speakers. Uh, now, um, you know, I, I just wanted to give space, like uh, allocate some time uh, if anyone had any questions or comments for the speakers. Uh, thank you, uh, Alex, for dropping the link. Uh, you can find the link on the book, but yeah, if anyone has um, any questions or comments for the speakers. I have, I have a question, John. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 first of all, I'd like to ask Michael, um, uh, how how can we arrange uh, a trip to the, the ship um, and uh, in Korea in March? So for the, for the audience. And my, my other my other um, uh, comment is I, I, I love the, 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 the roundup uh, from Alex there. Um, the um, the development of uh, social sciences in in the Pacific, um, you know, uh, how do you uh, uh, how well are those studies being resourced? Um, I know when I uh, was over with the University of South Pacific, funding was always an issue for the universities, um, and I think maybe Maria and uh, and uh, Eileen can also talk to talk to this. But what are the resources that are actually available to to the universities and the the higher education uh, facilities in the Pacific, and what can we do to boost those? So, Michael, Michael, maybe you first. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Gavin. Um, yeah, I think it's simple. Uh, we just have to fix a date. Um, I will talk uh, to the shipyard um, that we uh, come up with a date. And, and I think um, Windship Association would be uh, very nice uh, to, to put this uh, uh, into uh, your, your website and, and uh, announce this. Uh, so uh, we stay in touch about this. Uh, so I just wanted to announce this roughly February, March, probably will be March as things uh, go slower than you usually think, but um, um, I will fix a date and I will make contact and then we uh, see that everybody who is interested gets to know it. Gavin, th thanks for your second question on, on regional universities. I, I, I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in, but I've definitely two quick two quick comments there. Um, the, the, the first, uh, Joe Gens and, part, and I in partnership with uh, Mr. Allison Kellen and um, Leah Ragatol and, and their, their, their voyaging communities applied for a NOAA grant, which we were awarded just this year um, through their um, adaptation climate sciences. Um, so we'll be able to fund two Pacific Islander students to return to community to study ancestral sea knowledge, particularly through a, a lens of women's knowledge as well as men's knowledge towards the application of that knowledge um, for future sea transport. So, um, you know, I would say the first easy answer is um, it appeared from our feedback from reviewers at NOAA that they had seen very, very few um, grant applications covering this space. So I would say the first easy, um, the first easy thought is that for those of us who've been working in biocultural or other environmental and ecological concerns in Oceania, how can we partner further with um, transportation scholars and transportation practitioners? It's, I, um, I, I think it's the case that our Pacific voyaging conversation, for instance, has largely been focused on cultural renewal, identity, and um, agency of communities, um, it, um, 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 and is only now turning towards the application of all of that expertise from the um, reemergence of Hokulea and, and, and other voyaging um, leads across the region, or those who are always already voyaging, like our colleagues in the North Pacific uh, um, and Papa Mao's community and so on. But but. Um, to, to contemporary transportation concerns. But there's a second thought here. We have started to see um, uh, um, in the United States, and I think in Australia and New Zealand and elsewhere, scholarships for Pacific Islander and Oceanian students to engage in STEM training for environmental concerns. For those who might be involved with significant sources of support 
for sea transport concerns? Have you begun to think about funding scholarship programs for Oceanian students, for our Pacific Islander students to come to universities like Manoa, USP, Auckland, ANU, right? Wherever they may wish to go. Um, um, our, our Pacifica students have so much talent and expertise, but there's not enough funding for them to attend these large research universities in the numbers needed. Um, there's so much capacity. I would say that's the second. The second thing is scholarship programs. Even a modest one could be transformative for those students. Two thoughts, mahalo. Thank you, uh, Michael and Alex for your comments. And thank you, Gavin, for the question. I wanted to leave it if anyone else had other questions or comments. I know we've gone over time, but um, you know, it's uh, if you have any questions or any um, or you know any comments about today's uh, webinar, uh, you can always uh, contact uh, the website that I just posted on the group chat. Um, you know, and I respect everyone's time, and I thank you all for being here today for this webinar. I thank you um, uh, to all of the speakers to MCST as well as IWSA. You know, in celebrating this occasion, we were supposed to have um, an MOU signing between MCST and IWSA. And the chair for MCST, who is the Honorable uh, Will Bahaini, was uh, to be with us, but he was called on a cabinet meeting, unfortunately, and he will not be with us. However, a signing will take place, and you can always uh, refer to the website, uh, the MCST website, uh, for all of those updates. And I hope that all the updates from Michael, Alex, you know, we can um, post on the website as well. So. Uh, you know, without further ado, I wanted to, you know, finally end our webinar. And I thank you all for your time, for the space and for the Talanoa, the brief Talanoa we had, but I'm sure this is one of many more uh, great Talanoa sessions that we can have together. So with uh, Mahalo, Faxia, yeah. so much, Thanks, everyone. John. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, um, can I just, uh, before everyone leaves, I know that uh, Mr. Jerry Kramer, who is a board member for MCST, is online. And uh, uh, Jerry, would you like to uh, say a few words uh, before we end this, uh, Eleanor? Hi, Jerry, are you able to um, turn on your audio? We've had a lot of technical yes. issues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the joys of technology. Joys of living in third world country, but yeah, anyway, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, the the slides and everything will be posted on the website as well as a recording of today's webinar. So thank you very much again for your time and space. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Komul tata. Naka. une mission euh, d'abord de gestion et de supervision du trafic maritime. On est en contact permanent avec tous les navires euh, qui euh, arrivent dans les eaux territoriales.